no, Trailer Park of Terror. Who is, uh, the film just screened tonight at the Toronto After Dark Film Festival. And uh, my first question to you is, what drew you to, the, what drew you to this film? Uh, it was in the Earth's century, spinning on its axis, gravity. To be very honest, uh, I went in for an interview with a producer for another project altogether. I'd done a family film that was very musical, and this producer had a, a script called Kid Midnight, and he wanted to meet me. And when I was in the lobby, I saw all this trailer park of terror stuff, I saw these comic books. And I told my manager about this. I said, well, he's got another opening. And they went and they gave me a script to read that was just awful. And I said, this script has nothing to do with the comic books that I saw. They're nuts. Well, he said, well, take the meeting and tell him. And I went into the to this meeting and I was going to tell him that I think the script sucked. And the, and the producer, Jonathan Bogner, turns to me and says, so what do you think of the script? I hate it. And I went, well, that was easy. I, I, I said, I don't like it either. I said, it doesn't have anything to do with the comic books. I think, I think you're missing the boat. And I think it should be far, it should be southern, it should be crazy, it should be funny, it should be scary, it should have absolutely no taste whatsoever. Or it should be tasteless, actually. I think it's got taste, it's tasteless. It's disgusting at times, you know. Uh, it has, um, there's a little bit of old John Waters disgustingness in this movie. So, um, And I won him over with a pitch. There was no script at that point. I said, look, here's what I think it should be. You know, um, early on, uh, you know, I always I said it should be an origin story. It should be this, that, anything. And, you know, it, it, it evolved, but mainly out of my original pitch. So, uh, did there wasn't a script involved when you first met? Uh, met the there wasn't. He was attempting. Did you bring in the writer then to adapt the book? He had. He had. Um, well, they're actually just comic books. Mm -hmm. Telepark Terror is an old-fashioned comic book, not a graphic novel. And the, and, the, and the creators of the comic book. We're looking to see if they're here. The creators. Um, Why are they from Toronto? Or no, they they're from up? Media, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Uh, Reading, Pennsylvania. Excuse me, Reading, Pennsylvania. They. They. Um, what they created mm -hmm. was uh, a love letter to the old Tales from the Crypt EC comic books. So they proudly wear the comic book, not graphic novel uh, label. So um, they had tried, my understanding they had tried two scripts. One an anthology, just like the comic book, which no one liked. And then the second script that I read was all about sort of body modification in a trailer park in Nevada. And I went, this has, makes no sense. Uh, it's completely just using Trailer Park of Terror as the title. And then, and then yeah, well, in, in that world, I'm sorry, but I kept saying this to the producer, Trailer Park of Terror is not a scary title. It's kind of a kitschy title. So you have to make a movie that acknowledges the kitsch, but doesn't go camp. And he didn't. He didn't always understand that. He understood that by the end. He, he got it. He understood. Mm -hmm. So, I, like, I don't think I've made a campy movie. I think I've made a funny, scary, gross sort of goes. It's it's a mashup of many different yeah, things. It's true to the uh, true to a, true true to a to genre film. You're not. It's not tongue in cheek. No. You're no doing, one winks at the camera. No, no one goes. Yeah. Where's my penis? The joke. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, it, the humor comes out of the characters. A zombie gets blown up. Mm -hmm. He looks down. His penis is gone. Hence, where's my penis? I don't know about you, but if I got blown to pieces and I was still alive, and I looked down, yeah, yeah. and my member was gone, it would affect me. And that's how this humor has evolved. If you look at the scene when they're putting him back together, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's meant to be familial. It's meant to be like, these guys have now been together for 20 years dead. They were together for 20 years before, and, you know, and they're complaining about, you know, this is not clearly not the first time they put Roach back together again and that was because of his bloody... Play more mines. And that was a great gag too with all the uh, duct tape. Staple gun. Because anybody, you know, oh, we'll duct tape it. Duct tape it, clean up. Uh, we had, uh, in the, there, you know, in the early drafts and you have to cut away stuff, but we had Bondo because a trailer park without cars with lots of Bondo. Originally the devil, the devil, I wanted the devil to be this old guy in the hardware part of a Walmart with a little happy face pin with a little devil on there. That'd be awesome. And, and, and then she has no, she wants to buy this shotgun and these shells and she wants to buy all this, all the, all the stuff to blow up the trailer park and she has no money. She's barefoot, bloody, with no money. 
and he pulls out the ledger, well, you can buy on credit. Unfortunately, you know, probably the producer was right. He said, you'll never get into Walmart. They'll never let you film it there. Let's just do something simple. And I said, okay, well, and like, I'm friends with Trace Atkins, who plays the devil, so I just asked him. And, and we wrote it. I wrote it so with his sense of humor in mind. So, um, I don't know, I can't remember the exact numbers, but the uh, budget, the shooting budget is about 1.3. Well, no, we started we started shooting the movie at about 1.3, but um, we were raising money still mm -hmm. as we went. I think the finished budget, I don't really know, but it was probably... You know, somewhere between 2.5 and Did you have 3. to do a lot of compromising shooting Lots. the film? Yeah, because originally we set out, we hoped to have 20 days. About seven days in, we realized we were not going to have, we just weren't going to have that. Mm -hmm. We were going to end up, and so I had to rewrite the ending. You know, I wanted to have a much bigger Smash Up Derby because, you know, down south, the yeah. Smash Up Derbies are, well, actually, here in Ontario, you get to the Redneck yeah. Wonderlands, no. man, they love their Smash well, Up Derbies. it's funny because I'm watching the film, and as soon as I saw the Smash Up Derby, I'm like, yeah, that kicks ass. Well, originally it was it was supposed to be longer, and I had to while we're making the film, I had to do rewrites. But you know what? That's part of the fun. It really is. It's stressful, but when you're on your toes, having to think on your toes and come up with ideas, I like. We came up as a group. You know, you work together with your your second, your AD, your producer, you're off, and your makeup as you're all coming up with ideas. I love the way we solved the problem and because we needed Michael to betray Bridget. And, I, and the audience seems to love it. We came up with this idea that when Marv shows up, she, he pushes her down, and you know, after he's protected her at the beginning of the movie, he throws her to the ground, and the audience just loves it. He's, that's when he suddenly goes from being, all right, he's, he's a good gay character and we like him, he suddenly goes from being this good gay character to being fucking F word. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, did I just say fucking F word? Oh my God, that's no, sorry that's about that. No, but I mean, it's like I was okay saying yeah. fuck, but I was I had trouble saying fag. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, <laughs> Uh, yeah. um, so I was going to ask you, uh, we heard uh, tonight that the film is going to find a home on DVD. And the film, a, no, the film comes out th on uh, this coming Tuesday, October 21st in the U.S., October 20th, 28th in Canada. Soundtrack is released, uh, I think, all at the same time at Amazon and iTunes and this gonna be, Tuesday. Uh, there's going to be a director's cut. There is a director's cut. The unrated director's cut is on the DVD. It gets way, way grosser. Uh, we've got, we've got some, you know, we have three scenes that definitely got, how should we say, toned down for what was screened here in Ontario due to those sensors. No, no, I'm just kidding. And uh, one final thing. So you're here tonight at the Toronto After Dark Film Festival. What do you think of uh, the festival here? I. Wow, listen, Toronto is like a second home for me. I spent a lot of time here filming, so, I, you know, for me this was a homecoming. I, lots of friends were here. Um, I, I love the spirit of the festival. You know, it really reminds me of all the festivals I've been to. This one reminds me the most of Fright Fest in London because it's this one room and everyone's out front. And when you walk out front, everyone's there and, they, and you talk to your fans. And it's, it's very, for a director, it, there's nothing better because especially of a genre film, to hear firsthand from your fans, we you want your autograph, we want to talk to you, it's the most fun thing. So I, I really like that. I, you know, I don't want to be disrespectful to like Fantasia in Montreal, which I thought was great, mm -hmm. but it felt, it's weird because multiple screens, it's bigger. It, it, there's something about it that felt bigger. The audience was phenomenal, but I didn't feel this touchy-feely thing. What's great about After, Toronto After Dark, what's great about Fright Fest in London, I recommend I rec I mean, they should become they should become sister festivals because they have so much in common uh, that, that uh, there should be like the second city between Canada, Montreal, Toronto, excuse me, and London because they're very similar. Where you know the filmmakers and the fans are are are, are one, and it's that's what I love about the Bloor Street. Now, I have to say one I have one criticism because this is like one of the biggest theaters in terms of throw. The, it's it's so big that that projector, we got to get a brighter projector. We got to get a brighter projector for next year. And I and and let's 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 make that the mission. Sorry. Yeah, that's cool. No man, it's a heck of a day.
it's a it's a great theater, and I, I love the spirit. I, I, I have to uh, really do. What's your next project? Well, I'm working with uh, friends in Vancouver, a company called Infinity, mm -hmm. uh, who've done movies like Capote and uh, um, I mean uh, Snow Walker. Uh, Rob Merrilies, uh, uh, writer at a Montreal, Tony Dubinsky, and I uh, uh, have been working on uh, a real Canadian story. Um, it's uh, based on a true story. It takes place in 1976 and 77. It tells the story of a character who went by the name The Human Fly. Uh, some of you comic book fans out there may know about The Human Fly. Marvel did, I think, about 21 or 22 comic books about him with the tagline, the most incredible superhero ever because he's real. The whole, it's an incredible story about these guys who went on this adventure trying to outdo Evil Knievel. And they created this character, the Human Fly, and it was a big con. They were young guys. It's kind of like super bad meets Boogie Nights. It's a really, it's a very different thing. I'm, um, so that's one of the Canadian projects. Uh, I got a little gangster film that takes place in the hills of Kentucky. That actually inspired kind of the stuff that I ended up putting in Trailer Park. It's called The Mountain. It's, um, it's very much in the vein of movies like Mystic River and Gone Baby Gone, where those movies take place in Boston. This is a really true look at uh, uh, the crime world in Kentucky, in the Appalachia. One, another one of my favorite directors is uh, David Gordon Green and Undertow. And his earlier films are all set in the Deep South also. Yeah. And the Deep South has a very distinctive look. Yeah, and I think that um, a lot of times Hollywood doesn't get it. Uh, this, this script is written by a, a young writer named uh, Aaron Saylor, who writing a book about this stuff and a lot of it's based on true stories mm -hmm. that he learned of his cousin who worked in the sheriff's office he's telling him stories about it. he grew up in this town that you that's called euphemistically sewer though it's not the name of it that's what they mm -hmm. called it um, and then i am working with uh sort of the most current most exciting is that i've become really close friends with the producers of zombie strippers oh really and we're looking to make that movie so the poster can be from the director of trailer park of terror and the producers of zombie strippers comes so we're looking for that next thing we think we've got a couple of scripts we like i'm hoping that that's the next thing because i love these guys they are they're just great producers and um i kind of like the idea of of uh of the, of the three of us working together That'd so awesome. I, I, i'm thinking I'm thinking we'll have something soon. That, that I'm hoping, because I'd love to come back. Mm -hmm. I'd love to be able to shoot something this year and come back to be able to come back and premiere here. That'd be nice. It'll be nice to premiere here. That'd be awesome. So, another genre picture, I hope. So, you're a big fan of the horror genre? I, but, um, I, yes, I, I, I'm a very big fan of the horror genre. I have specific taste. I'm, I, I, I don't feel that... Um, I, I don't think I'm the guy to make a, a, for, to do another film that basically treads on uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Deliverance. I'm a little sort of man's and man into man, hunting men, uh, uh, torture porn. I'm a little bit. I don't know if I'm the guy. Now listen, I torture in my movie, mm -hmm. but I, I sort of set it up in a fantasy world. So there's certain things that I do look for. I am looking to do a much more straight-ahead horror film. Yeah, you don't watch the, the uh, five kids in the van being chased by a maniac. No, no, I can't do that again. I, I'm not. I'm not. As much as I love vampires, mm -hmm. I don't think now is the time to do a vampire movie. I don't really want to do a zombie movie. So I'm. You know, the things that I'm looking for are a little different. But I love creature features. I, I do love monsters, and I'd love to. I'd love to do a real serious monster movie. Something that. You know, like the late Stan Winston would be really proud of. That'd be awesome. That, 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 if I could pick what I wanted to do next, it would be the kind of monster movie that a guy like Stan Winston would say, "Good job." You know, I, 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 that's, that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to, and you know, and, and in, that, in that world, I'd say, you know, where the yardstick would be alien, not aliens, but alien. Yeah. Sure. You know, um, that, that movie's been very influential on me. I mean, even in Trailer Park of Terror, there are allusions to the influences of alien on me and it's and it's it's not so much in the holding back but it is about who dies first mm -hmm. i mean a lot of the decisions in the writing about who died first in trailer park of the, of the gang of our gang of once we get to the from the once the prologue is done the past prologue and we're into the present day i mean a lot of that is a lot of that is is influenced by what the writer dan o'bannon did with with alien
my dart boards, the darts would be hitting us. Yeah. Maybe we can get a bunch of trolls. We need to get some darts. Ah. We'll CG those in after. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I just want a dart right here. Do my interview like that. With blood dripping.